Hi, I am Tracy Leslie, Senior Pastor at Trinity United Methodist Church in downtown Lafayette, Indiana. Hear this gospel reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse beginning at verse 35. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. The next day, John the Baptist again was standing with two of his disciples. And as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which is translated anointed. He brought Simon to Jesus who looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John, you are to be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him about whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathaniel replied, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered, do you believe? Because I told you I saw you under a fig tree. You will see greater things than these. You will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the sun of man. This is the gospel of our Lord. <clears throat> Today is the second in this month-long sermon series entitled, Who Do You Think You Are? I personally <laughs> of the opinion that for most of us, our reflections as we enter a new year aren't so much about slimming our waistlines or eating more vegetables, although I am a big fan of vegetables. But for many of us, reflections around the start of a new year go deeper, perhaps provoking some consideration of who we are, our identity, our goals, our purpose. Bringing out that new calendar is always a good time to take stock of our lives. Last Sunday, I preached on the story of Jesus's baptism, and we celebrated that above all else, our primary identity is beloved child of God. That is the most important label that can ever be used to describe us. Now, as we think about who we are, many of us could run through a whole host of labels or adjectives, right? I could describe myself, a Christian, a wife, a pastor, a petite woman, a musician, a friend, a sister, a dog lover, a fitness enthusiast. I know I've shared before about the gentleman at a previous church where I pastored. There were multiple clergy on staff. John called all of them by their first names except me. I was addressed as Rev. And there was something about John's tone when he called me that that made me feel proud. That was the label that I wore proudly. 
I'd like you to invite you right now to take just a moment and compose this video if you'd like to. Take just a moment to consider two questions. The first one is this. What is a frequent label, title, or description that others use for you? It can be a label related to your appearance, your character, particular relationship, your occupation, any number of things. And then the follow-up question to that one, and again, you can pause the recording to think about this. The second question is, how do you feel about that label, title, or description? So again, a label or title that others use to describe you. And how do you feel about that label, title, or description? I can't think of many Bible stories that contain more labels or titles than this passage from the Gospel of John. Labels and descriptions are attached to Jesus and to his disciples. Simon is given a new name, Peter. Daniel is described as an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. But most of the labels or descriptions in this, these verses that I just read are attached to Jesus. John the Baptist labels him as the Lamb of God. He is addressed with the label rabbi or teacher. He's declared Messiah, which can mean anointed one or Christ. He is the one of whom Moses in the law and the prophets wrote. He is Jesus of Nazareth. He is Joseph's son, or so they say. He is the son of God, the king of Israel, and the son of man. And this is only the first chapter. John's gospel is packed with these descriptions. It is the only gospel in which Jesus declares his own identity numerous times, beginning each of those descriptions or labels with I am. I am the bread of life, Jesus says. I am the light of the world. I am the sheep gate and I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. I am. That mysterious, enigmatic name by which God introduces himself when he encounters Moses at the burning bush. Jesus is all of these things and even more. The beauty of John's gospel is that as the story progresses, more and more layers are revealed and our understanding of Jesus just continues to expand. Jesus is not some plastic savior to be placed on a shelf or even some flat religious figurehead. There is so much to Jesus. Even in a lifetime, we will never come to know him in his entirety. As the Apostle Paul told the Corinthian Christians, now we know only in part. There will always be more of Jesus to discover and experience. But there are other labels given to Jesus as well in John's Gospel. When G Pilate parades him in front of the angry mob. They label Jesus a criminal. Labels are a powerful thing. They can build us up or tear us down. They can more deeply disclose our identity or distort it. Labels are powerful. So who labels you? And what labels have really stuck? How have they shaped your self-perception? For many of us, it is not the affectionate, affirming labels that we latch onto. Rather, our souls have been scarred 
by the labels that judge and condemn. Likely all of us can remember a label someone gave us that crushed our spirit. A label given by one who had no right to label us, for they did not know us. They did not know the person God created and called us to be. I have one final reflection question for you this week. And again, you can pause the recording to think about it. What is a label, title, or description you wish others would use for you? Take a moment to consider that. This weekend, we pause to remember Martin Luther King Jr., often labeled a civil rights leader, and certainly he was, but he was so much more. He was a husband and a father who had deep concern for his family's safety after their lives were threatened and a bomb tossed outside their living room. King was also a student of great spiritual leaders like Mahatma Gandhi and Howard Thurman. It was Thurman, the dean of the chapel at Boston, who served as King's spiritual guide, who mentored and taught him the lessons of Gandhi and his nonviolent movement. King was also a scholar. In three short years, he earned a PhD in one of the most challenging subjects, systematic theology, at a top-notch university. King was scholar, preacher, motivational speaker, father and husband, advocate for peace and justice, defender of African Americans, the poor, and all those oppressed or marginalized. That those who opposed him stamped him with other labels I certainly wouldn't want to say in a sermon recording. How fortunate all of us are that he shook off those denigrating labels and embraced his God-given identity and call. Imagine how many times King, like his namesake Martin Luther, had to remind himself, I am baptized and a beloved child of God. Friends, at the start of a new year is truly a time to look deep within ourselves. I encourage us all to shake off the painful, hurtful labels others have saddled us with and embrace who God names us to be. I invite us to summon the courage to go deeper in knowing Christ, ourselves, and others. For far too many people spend the entirety of their lives on the surface, never seeking an intimate connection to God, talking at God, rather than being in fellowship with God. They spend their lives never looking deeply within themselves, and never looking past stereotypes and caricatures to discover the beauty and complexity within others, particularly those who are not like them. Many of us were raised in cultures where we often attach labels and descriptions to those with whom we had no genuine encounter. We all seem to fear what we do not know, and so we attach labels. We label God and rob him of his mystery. Labels limit our self-understanding, and labels distance us from one another. It is easy to simply absorb the assumptions our culture taught us. Perhaps we were told that God is a rule giver who rewards, rewards rule keepers and punishes rule breakers. Perhaps we were raised in a family that categorized those who were different. In order to make our little world feel safe, orderly, and controllable. And the labels others attach to us are often a source of either shame or stress, because even positive labels, the brainy one, the pretty one, 
the athletic one, can prevent us from fully exploring the person God created and called us to be. They can easily become a source of anxiety. After all, if we lose our label, who on earth are we? Which brings me back to where I started. You are a beloved child of God. Unique, complex, not a label or a category. Let me close with an example. Imagine you stood on the banks of a beautiful river. You could see it and observe it. But you would only see what is on the surface. You could offer a description, but it would be superficial, perhaps even misleading. Or you could take a risk and jump into the river, swim in it, touch the bottom, notice the temperature of the water. Parts of the experience might be wonderful, perhaps others not so much. Still, either way, you would know the river as it truly is, for you had immersed yourself in it. St. Catherine of Siena speaks of immersing ourselves in God in this way when she writes, You, O eternal Trinity, are a deep sea into which the more I enter, the more I find. And the more I find, the more I seek. Friends, we are all much more than even the sum total of our labels. So at the start of this new year, I want to encourage you. Take a deep breath, a deep breath in of God's breath, God's spirit and then jump in to the river of life.